Hi there, I'm Stephen W. Taylor, and this is Two Guys Talking Rush. Guys are talking, brush two, 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 two guys, two guys are talking, brush two guys are talking, brush two, two guys, two guys are talking, brush, 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 two guys. And now, get ready for the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast with your hosts, John Kane and Dan Buxman. Hi, folks. My name is John Kane, and this is the delightful Dan Buxman. And welcome to episode 16 of Two Guys Talking Rush, another milestone for a couple of middle-aged slackers who had nothing better to do during a pandemic but to start a podcast and geek out about their favorite band, Rush. Listen in, and you'll discover that Two Guys Talking Rush is the mother of all Rush podcasts. Dan, how are you, buddy? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, and I want to thank uh, Mike Shu uh, for sitting in for me, and uh, I thought he was great. Uh, I was a little worried about my job. Like, is is this guy gonna, you know, because he's, you know, he's a pro, and uh, it, to me, it was like really, you know, like I told you before, this this was a master class in how you do this, and uh, you know, I'm I'm glad he was able to come in, and I'm glad you guys were able to do this show. I enjoyed it when I watched yeah. it. So. Yeah, and you know, um, Mike, I've known Mike for a while, and he's been a staple of uh, Boston Rock Radio, and you're right, he brings a level of uh, expertise beyond you or I even combined. Right. Yeah. Um, and also, most importantly, Mike Shue is a major Rush fan who could talk about yeah. Rush fluidly uh, and with uh, good, uh, good analysis, and uh, that's what we want. Uh, for any replacement, uh, <laughs> temporary replacement of the show. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't want to have to school anybody on Rush, man. No. You know, you know, it, although that would be kind of awkward to just have somebody on here that didn't know anything about it. like, what, what's a Rush? <laughs> what's a, what is that? I don't know. Yeah, exactly, you know, exactly. Is that Let's... a woman singing? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's glad to, I'm glad to have you back. It's good to have you back. Good uh, to how, be here. how was your week off? Uh, anything, uh, anything fun? Uh, I, <laughs> I, I was dealing with someone else's uh, medical situation okay. That's not fun. So, no it really isn't no. although it was much less fun for them right than it was for me yeah stop uh, being so st selfish yeah I'm, no. hey you know i'm a i'm a very famous person i don't have time for these things uh, no it's exactly. it's fine you know just uh family things they come up sometimes yeah but everyone's fine and Good. We're moving on. Good, good. We wish you the best and your family the best. Thank you. And uh, we're at uh, episode 16. Your thoughts? Another major milestone. Uh, we have blown way past uh, any quantity of anything that I've ever done before. Because uh, I've, I've done a lot of things where I'll meet someone else. We have some interest. It's like, let's collaborate on this. And it just, you know, it tends to kind of fall apart after just a couple of episodes. This keeps on going and uh it's i mean i would like to say it's because we're so fascinating but it, it's the topic and there's so much there and uh i feel like so many people have not even barely scratched the surface with all there is to talk about with this band uh you in know other in other words we're just a couple of bags of hot air <laughs> yeah but but we have good topics to yeah, be we do, we do. hot air about yeah you know? exactly yeah. um you know just looking at you know what we have coming up in like the next few months and weeks and what it's, there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff and I'm very excited and you could not do this with, uh, you know, two guys talking striper. I don't think. I love that show. Yeah. It's a great show. Um, but I, I just don't, I don't know that it's all there. I don't know that it's such fertile ground, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's true. No, no slight to striper, a very, uh, important, band uh, as, it, yeah. as it relates to religion and metal right i mean geez yeah actually yeah. The, yeah yeah to hell yeah, with the devil true. man you know yep exactly uh, yeah we the yellow and black 
attack. <laughs> um, well, anyway, th thanks for the Sorry. striper. No, no, I love the striper reference. We make lots of references to, we do. to the, the metal world and we love metal and all that. So, Oh, I, I would also like to say one other thing. Um, sure. We're, we're recording this in advance of when it's going to air. Right. And by the time this airs, the election will have happened. So right now, all of you out there know what happened and we're in the past and don't know. So as you listen to this, having no idea what's going on out there, just remember, wow, those two guys don't know what happened. Well, at least, you know, if, if shit really hits the fan, you'll have a podcast to listen to in your bunker, folks. Yeah. Because uh, we, don't, we don't know what sort of uprising is going to occur yeah. from both sides. This is to say. Yeah. Show. We're, not, uh, we're not talking about uh, who, we, who we vote for on the show yeah. at all. But, uh, and Just religion. That's yeah. all we talk about is religion. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, religion, uh, striper and all that. But uh, anyway, you're right. Uh, this is a future episode and a lot might be changed uh, by the time this airs so it'll be interesting uh, to, yeah. or not and yeah. it'll be interesting to look back and and reflect on those uh on those transformations uh anyway um moving on uh, again yes i'd like to thank uh my friend and famed rock radio host boston rock personality legend and major uh, rush fan mike shu he did a great job loved having him on mike if you're listening you know, what can I say? Uh, the checks in the mail, you're, you're, you're quite the dude. Um, you know, Dan and I uh, joke uh, about how each show could possibly be our last, but uh, hey, in honor uh, of our friend in last week's episode, uh, uh, guest Billy Sheehan, I think it's fair to say that both Dan and I are addicted to that rush. We are, exactly. Very good, by the way. Very well played. Thank you, sir. I, yes. oh, I didn't bring that up to Billy. I think maybe that would have been too elementary. No, of course you didn't bring what it up. A, what an asshole. Addicted. <laughs> yeah, that's not like, a I'm rush. out. I'm out. That's, uh, <laughs> none of that shit. Billy, are you really addicted to that? What did you mean in that song, addicted yeah. to that rush? Okay. You're addicted to rush? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, remember, folks, this show is hosted by fans for fans, and our listeners know we are inclusive. Each week we try and mix it up with guests and good content, rich content. We want fans to join us on this magnificent journey and hope that we hope that translates uh to your ears uh and your speakers uh, wherever you're listening uh dan we lost uh uh you know it seems like we're losing someone of major significance in the music world uh weekly unfortunately yeah. i guess it's the age uh, this time uh in life where people are kind of transitioning um in that way and uh, we lost eddie van halen and it's yes, uh, and i know that it's hit uh the rush fan base pretty hard i've been reading sure. the forums and i know a lot of rush fans are van halen fans i'm i'm a van halen fan uh, many people grew up listening to van halen alongside with rush you know here we want to acknowledge these people because sometimes and most often they were on tour with rush and there's a there's a connection in that way so we want to acknowledge the incredible uh prowess of uh eddie van halen and his impact on on uh, just that style of guitar play at least if you're not a van halen fan his style of guitar playing was so influential yeah i mean even if you're not into the music for whatever reasons like you have to acknowledge that what he did was just absolutely revolutionary nobody had done anything like that before and you know i mean i remember after those guys got popular and he like really uh he became the guy that just everyone wanted to emulate everyone i knew when i was a teenager suddenly bought a guitar started tapping you know that sort of thing he really inspired a lot of people. And I, re I remember bands that were active at the time changing their style a little bit to incorporate that kind of playing. These were like established bands. Uh, Judas Priest, uh, who at that point, like I feel had nothing to prove. Uh, sudden, you know, suddenly KK's there doing the hammering, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was an enormous, uh, it was a sea change in music, I thought. Um, and, you know, having him gone, uh, you know, well, it, I was not as attached to their music as I was to Rush. Sure. And so I was not as big a fan of his as I was of Neil. Sure, of course. But I'm feeling like kind of sort of the same vibe of like that something has been yanked away from us that we kind of assumed was always going to be there. I took them totally for granted and just assumed, they'll, you know, they'll be around forever. And, you know, they, they may have these like multiple year uh, spats with the different members, you know, there might be all that that was playing out publicly, but I, I just always assumed eventually 
they would get it together and come back and do something. I'm, you know, and I'm sorry that wasn't the case. Um, but you know, that, that music will last forever. And uh, the only person uh, who I feel kind of sorry for, uh, as I've been reading all the tributes and everything, is Gary Cherone, who is just completely <laughs> overlooked in this whole thing and uh, is used occasionally as a punchline, which, is, which I feel bad about because uh, he had to know that was kind of a thankless job stepping into those shoes. And, uh, you know, he just, he wasn't really given an opportunity. I don't think to really, uh, make his place yeah. in the band, but yeah, you know. I, 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 you know, I, I used to work at, uh, well, first off, I have a history with Gary, Gary Shore, not on an intimate level, but he grew up in yeah, Mal Boston. Malden, yeah, Malden yeah. Massachusetts or Melrose Malden, I think. And, mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in Somerville and when I was a very young person, uh, uh a teenager, uh, you know, I would go to rec this place called Record Man, and it was a place where you could buy records and tapes and all that. Um, mm -hmm. Not strawberries. I think there were some strawberries records and tapes in New York, uh, I believe. No. Not, uh, no, there weren't? Oh, okay. All right. Well, strawberries records and tapes was a place I used to work at. And then, oh, yeah. Um, uh, in Boston, we would go to the local mall, and, and you'd buy all your stuff. And Gary was in a band called Extreme. Well, it was the X-Dream, uh, The Dream, uh, and... Um, you know bent court and they would all be hanging at the mall and we would talk to them and uh they had a song called mama don't want to go to school today and that was always on like v66 or whatever local right bootleggy uh video station uh was on uh locally and uh, they were kind of local favorites you know we were waiting for them to to really explode uh flash forward uh the freddie mercury concert uh the tribute concert where you know that was some 89 or 88 or something 91, 91. maybe 90 thank, or maybe 92 thank you very much so yeah. i'm working at uh, strawberries record tapes gary comes in and it was just like three days after uh he performed them like dude you know because I, I always sensed by talking to him that he was just a f more of a fan than he was uh this this leader lead singer he never really yeah. seemed to have an ego and i was like he was up there jamming with uh tony iomi i was like what was that like and we were talking about it and then you know 20 years later i'm at a starbucks i'm working on my dissertation and uh he comes in and i'm like whoa gary what's up and then we just caught up and then we talked about the van halen stuff and again you see oh. in all the articles he says he says you know if anything man he goes there was an opportunity to jam with one of my favorite bands and just i mean how rich is that you know just it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, one one thing that I saw him say was that he wished that they had a, uh, like a little bit more time. Yeah, it seemed more rushed. Yeah, yeah, to just, yeah, to just kind of like break it in a little yeah, more. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, and I mean, the, I don't know. I I have kind of a soft spot uh, for people who come into an existing situation sure. that's impossible. Sure. And like, uh, I'm a Blaze Bailey fan. I sure. like the Blaze Bailey Iron Maiden albums. Yeah. Uh, I feel very bad for Ripper Owens. Yeah. You know, all the, there are all these people who are like, you know, they were stepping into someone else's shoes. I'm sure they knew stepping into it like, okay, uh, I don't know. I don't know about this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and, uh, they would just get, a, they would get a lot of disrespect back from audiences. Yeah. And I don't know. That's, and that, I don't know. That just, that annoyed me. That bothered me. And I felt like in, in his case too, he should have been given more of an opportunity and a little more time, uh, you know, to find his feet. But didn't have yeah. have you listened to that i mean I, I guess i need to listen to that album more van halen three I, no no, no. Okay. <laughs> there, is it i agree with him that okay. they needed more time oh, okay. <laughs> to, to write other I, songs and that kind I, of thing i guess I just it's not, it's not a great album it's, it's not uh, okay all right some i mean some of it is good but it just yeah. sounds kind of like they don't know quite mm. what they want to do yeah so. There's no identity, no no identity here. Exactly. Here and there, it's like, oh, okay, that's them. You know, there are yeah. some. It does pop out at times, and you know, and again, he's he's fine. You know, yeah. you know he doesn't like he doesn't like stink up the joint or anything yeah. like that. You know, but it just it. I think people just couldn't. Uh, so I've saw, I've seen some live performance stuff, and you know, he's trying, man. You know, uh, you know, he's really trying to engage the audience. But yeah, what are you what are you gonna? What are you going to do? You know, it's, there's a lot on his plate and uh, you're right about that. You know, um, in my research, you know, I was like, what, you know, what sort of connections could I make to Eddie Van Halen and Rush? And I discovered a story that maybe most fans know about, or I, I didn't know about, but uh, this is from Ultimate Classic Rock. It's uh, titled 35 Years Ago, Van Halen and Rush Begin 
beer fueled backstage beef. And I just thought this was kind of funny. Uh, I'll read this. So the guys in Rush have always seemed like uh, pleasant down to earth fellows that it seems difficult to believe they've ever feuded with anyone. But in the summer of 1980, their calm Canadian hackles were raised uh, by some spilled beer and those rowdy ruffians in Van Halen. Singer David Lee Roth shared the story of the band's unlikely seeming beef during an 81 interview with, uh, with Cream, revealing that it all started the night of June 20th, 1980, after Van Halen's show in Leicester uh, and, and Rush's concert at the Birmingham Odeon. Uh, quote, we'd come back to the bar and Rush was staying at the same hotel. And as it turns out later, they rented the bar with all the booze in it. Uh, end quote, recalled Roth, pointing out that the band was extra keyed up because they were celebrating bassist Michael Anthony's birthday. According to Roth, the VH crew didn't know Rush had dibs on the bar. And when they arrived, things went down pretty much the way you'd expect. Quote, our guys came in and said, what, free booze? Exclamation point. Whoa. I guess David Lee Roth. Wow. And yeah. they cleaned <laughs> and they <laughs> snipping and bapping and bop. And yeah. then they cleaned uh, the place out, which uh, rushes guys on the edge, which put rushes guys on the edge a little bit. Things were eventually smoothed, smoothed over enough for Eddie Van Halen and Getty Lee to end up drinking together at the same table. Unfortunately, that's when the evening went from bad to worse. Quote, they'd both been drinking a little bit, and Getty was playing some Rush tapes on the tape recorder. He said something to Ed, and Ed's beer got into the tape recorder, Roth alleged. Well, that caused a little friction. That friction played into an incident that took place roughly a year later when both bands ended up playing in Nevada on June 16th, 1981, Van Halen in Las Vegas, Rush and Reno. According to Roth, everyone in Van Halen's crew was banned from the Rush show, but friendships among the crew, among crew members allowed for a few loopholes, although uh, what went down afterwards was far from friendly. Quote, after the show, we're sitting in the casino. There's tables filled with Van Halen people. There's 47 to 50 of us on the road now, continued Roth. And Getty feels one way or another and comes up to say something to Ed. And he puts his hand to shake hands. Now, one of our security guards didn't have the vaguest idea in hell who he was and came up and body tackled him, end quote. Roth laughed it off during the interview, adding that was the last time he's seen Getty Lee. And when the subject came up during a Rolling Stone Q&A in 2014, Lee downplayed and lingered bad vibes between, downplayed any lingering bad vibes between the bands. Quote, Getty Lee saying, oh, that's an interesting memory. He mused. We were at a hotel bar in Leicester and one of the guys in our road crew had his beatbox playing. And the guys in Van Halen were a little inebriated, and we were on our way to getting inebriated. So I think some beer was spilt. Yes. End quote. Whoa. I don't associate Rush with drunken brawls. I don't either usually. at all. It was yeah. such a weird little story. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, that's not really a brawl so much as like, hey, hey, hey there, don't do that. You know, that kind of thing. There's the uh, connection. There's yeah, the... No, but nobody's nose was broken or anything like that, so... I think Rush would kick Van Halen's ass. Uh, there's more with, with of Van with, Halen, though. With intellect. <laughs> with intellect, yes. But, uh, you know, Roth could do those high kicks, and, uh, you know, he had the the jujitsu and all that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. So I, Roth, would do, Roth would diffuse, the, diffuse uh, Rush with his babbling of yes. odd, oddity. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's funny. Um, anyway, uh, that's what we do here, folks. So two guys talking rush. We talk about weird, odd nonsense. Nonsense. Yeah. yeah well, sure. um, you know, some show plugs, which I have to do before I forget. I want to thank um, our guests on episodes 14 and 15 basis, Billy Sheehan known for his work with Talis, Steve Vai, David Lee Roth, a Van Halen connection, Mr. Big, Niacin and the winery dogs, his latest sons of Apollo, the progressive metal super group formed in 2017 composed of drummer, Mike Portnoy, bassist, Billy Sheehan, keyboardist, Eric Sherinian, vocalist, Jeff, Cots Jeff Scott Soto and guitarist, Ron Bumblefoot Thal, if you haven't heard uh, um, uh, Sons of Apollo, do it now. They're great. Uh, what a great band. Listen to them. Uh, that was a special. Those episodes are very special. Another milestone uh, in the Two Guys Talking Rush uh, uh, podcast. Uh, and I also want to thank all of our previous guests who've, who've taken the time to share their stories about Rush uh, in the past. So thank you very much 
to all our guests, not just yes. this one, of course. Um, as a reminder, you can hear our podcast on TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Simplecast, and others. This show is recorded in video, so please check out our YouTube channel and click subscribe. Do it now. A quick uh, shout out to RushRadio.org. You can find Rush Radio on your TuneIn app uh, and also at RushRadio.org. I want to thank Ed Stenger at RushAsABand.com. We love Rush as a band. That's where you're going to find all of your most up-to-date Rush information, no matter what. If there's if 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 they put out Rush napkins, you're going to find out uh, that there's uh, that those exist on RushAsABand.com. And also uh, Power Windows, the Power Windows website at 2112.net. Just two to the premier Rush websites, I think, uh, as far as my analysis is concerned. Um, uh, another quick shout out to the mighty Why Why Not. Uh, their music can be heard in our show intro uh, an incredible incredible band and uh, just great performers i've been watching if you if you're if you're friends with why why not on facebook or any other uh channel or platform uh the bassist tim Starachi, he um you know he in his downtime he he does these live videos where he's playing bass to some to, to musical tracks most most of them are rush and he's just so good He's really good. He's just a great like godlike. I he would, really I would is. Say. Right? Yeah, no, actually, he's just yeah. so talented, man. He does it so easily. Uh, well, anyway, Rush fans, we want to hear from you. Uh, if you have any comments, suggestions, ideas, or questions about the show, please submit them. Uh, we would like to hear from you. Email us at two t w o. Thank you, Dan. Two guys yep. talking rush uh, at gmail. Uh, we're always looking for super fans. If you're a Rush super fan, uh, we want to spotlight you. What makes up a super fan? What makes you a super fan? I don't know. Uh, do you have, I always say this, but do you have a tattoo of Rush on your ass? Uh, uh, you know, this Rush spelled out on your, on your, on your toes and tattoo. Uh, what? You got 3,000 buttons that you wear in one. Do you have an armor of Rush buttons? Anything, you know, just what makes you special and uh, uh, share that story and, and show us on uh, uh, Two Guys Talking Rush. We want to hear from all super fans. Not just the ones that have done, you know, that are out there, uh, you know, writing plays and uh, and making movies. But we really want to talk to just all Rush fans, you know, that are. Yeah, we, we really don't want people to feel like um, this is limited only to like, you, you know, like, oh, superstar type right, people right. or anything like that. If you're a fan, we want you. Yes. We are fans. Right. Uh, the whole point of doing this is this is like we say on every show by the fans for the fans. That's right. And I've had some people say like, oh, I, you know, who I approached about maybe coming on her like, oh, I don't know. I mean, you, you know, Donna Halper is on, I, you know, and it's like, that's not the point And that's not why we're doing this. We're, this is about basking in the glow of rush fandom. That's right. And uh, you know, there's, there's no, uh, you don't you don't have to be a famous fabulous person to be on the show if you have an interesting story have seen 50 shows you know whatever uh we want to hear from you so however you you must have a rush budget you must have like an allocated funds that you spend a certain amount on rush every year so, yeah that's probably know, that should exceed you know, 50 bucks that's true yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well uh anyway uh check us out our website is uh, www.2two two guys talking rush.com our facebook page facebook.com slash two guys two two guys talking rush also twitter twitter.com slash the number two two guys talk rush uh you'll find us on there uh, don't worry and again please subscribe to our two guys talking rush youtube channel where you can see uh, our beautiful faces uh, lastly, um, you know, we receive no rev revenue at all from doing this podcast. We do it out of our pure love. We're fueled by the love of Rush to keep this thing going. Uh, however, it does take a small amount to keep the show going, uh, uh, a nominal amount. If you're interested in helping us uh, continue with our passion for this podcast uh, um, and, uh, and also helping us bring you uh, the most up-to-date Rush new in Rush news and awesome guests and content, uh, check out our newly uh, launch Two Guys Talking Rush store at uh, www.twoguystalkingrush.com where you can acquire a coffee mug, a t-shirt, a button, a sticker with our logo on it, and other cool stuff. Even a mask if yes. you want to walk around with two guys. I don't know. That's Why not, you know? <laughs> 
it's no worse than any of the other <laughs> I, I was gonna say not uh, as offensive as the one that has a no, smile on yeah, it you know it's like and, i'm not smiling okay yeah yeah everything in the store has the two guys two gtr yeah. logo on it uh two gtr podcast this logo. handsome logo that you see behind me exactly, exactly. on all this stuff exactly yeah. check check it out um anyway uh, moving on to this week uh, in Rush history, or this month in Rush history, uh, 1974, uh, Rush played the Century Two Performing Arts and Convention Center in Wichita, Kansas, on the Rush Tour. In 1974, they played the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, uh, on the Rush Tour. In 76, Rush played the Kinsman Fieldhouse in Edmonton, Alberta, on the All the Worlds of Stage Tour. In 77, Rush played the Municipal Auditorium in San Antonio, Texas, on a Farewell to Kings Tour. In 1978, Rush played the Keystone Center in Brandon, Manitoba on the Hemispheres Tour. In 1984, Rush played the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis, Tennessee on the Grace Under Pressure Tour. In 1985, Alex Lifeson appeared on the UK music show The Old Grey Whistle Test. In 1990, Chronicles, the video collection, was released on VHS. In 1993, Neil interviewed future Canadian Prime Minister Jean Crescian on, I'm saying that so wrong, on uh, Much Music. Crescian. We'll get some emails about that. Crescian. Uh, in 1996, pl uh, Rush played the Nutter Center in Dayton, Ohio on the Test for Echo Tour. Slash Alex Lyson's Strip and Go Naked from Victor was released on Guitars That Rule the World, Volume 2 in 1996. In 96, Test for Echo was certified gold by the R RIAA. Uh, also, uh, Rush played the Van Andel Arena in Grand Rapids, Michigan on the Test for Echo Tour. In 98, wow, 96 was a big year for Rush. Uh, in 98, uh, the film Free Enterprise was released with a scene in which one character confuses Rush with Yes. 2002, Rush played the Air Canada Centre in Toronto, Ontario on the Vapor Trails Tour. Also, Working Man performed by the Suplex was released on, oh my God. on Sucking the 70s. Yeah. In 2006, uh, today's episode of Heroes included a restaurant named the Fly-By-Night Diner. In 2007, Rush played the Datch Forum di Asago in Milan, Italy on the Snakes and Arrow Tour. Uh, 2012, Rush played the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York on the Clockwork Angels tour. Uh, did you see them at the, uh, in Brooklyn when they came? Yes. How is, that, how is that venue? It's the worst venue you could possibly go to. Um, <laughs> the sound is awful. Really? Um, and this, the seats are at this angle, like this really steep angle. And um, it's just, and it's incredibly expensive. And uh, if you <laughs> if you suffer from vertigo or dizziness, don't go there unless you can get floor seats. Because, oh. like, seriously, I'm not kidding. Like, scaling to the top yeah. is an effort. And oh. uh, you know, and, and you know, when you get up that height, just everything's on the screen. You can't see the stage. Yeah, what's the point? It's yeah. like every everything that sucks about stadium shows all yeah, there let's go watch tv i know yeah. basically yeah um but uh yeah the the performance obviously you can't say anything bad about that <laughs> yeah uh they made the best of it so yeah interesting um uh 2015 presto and roll the bones were reissued on 200 gram heavyweight vinyl and high-res digital audio in 2018 alex lifeson's painting titled self self portrait number two donated to the annual a brush of hope charity auction sold for twelve thousand. $111. Wow. Um, more in Rush news. Rush, British guitarist Spencer Davis of the Spencer Davis Group passed away this week yeah. at the age of 81. Uh, Getty Lee took some time out to remember the iconic guitarist via his Instagram account saying, quote, last night I heard the sad news that the great Spencer Davis has passed away. I made It made me recall when I was a mere 14 years old, I first heard the infectious repeating two note bass riff that drew me into that joyous song, Give Me Some Lovin'. It is a great song. Yeah. It was the Spencer Davis group with Stevie Winwood and his brother Muff playing that groove on his Harmony H22 bass. That song, along with I'm a Man, Keep on Running, and so many others, made me run out to buy that album as it became a mainstay of my early listening days. R.I.P. Spencer, you brought so much great music to so many, and I thank you very heartfelt message yeah. uh, by Getty. Um, and you could tell that he really means it. Uh, also, Alex Lifeson's, again, going back to A Brush of Hope, Alex Lifeson's A Brush of Hope charity auction painting called Forked. 
is now avail available for bidding. Alex explains the name of the pa painting in his Facebook post uh, from Rush, uh, the Rush Facebook page, uh, saying a small point of interest, the painting forked was created entirely by using a fork, not brushes. Oh, thanks, Alex. That's really yeah, weird. Yeah. That's really that weird. That explains it. <laughs> thanks for being really weird, Alex. We, uh, yeah, we appreciate exactly. that. Yeah, awesome. Um, anyway, uh, Canada's annual A Brush of Hope charity auction fundraiser uh, kicked off uh, uh, recently, as I mentioned, and uh, Lifeson is once again one of the many Canadian celebrities, par ce celebrities participating by donating their original paintings. His comp contribution this year uh, is 11 by 14 acrylic painting, again, titled Fork. So you can find that on the Brush of Hope uh, Facebook uh, page. Ari Gold's 2008 film, Adventures of Power, featuring Neil Peart, re-released in support of Music Cares charity. Uh, Adventures of Power is a 2008 indie film, which chronicles the adventures of air drummer extraordinaire Power, played by filmmaker Ari Gold. It contains a cameo from Neil Peart, along with a slew of Rush references, including Tom, a Tom Sawyer air drum off. In addition to the Neil Peart cameo, the film boasts an all star cast, including Michael McKean, Jane Lynch, Adrian Grenier, and many others. Um, I guess back in 2009, Neil uh, and Ari uh, paid a visit to the Drum Channel Studios to record an interview discussing the film and also the film. Uh, also to film an air drum off video, which you can check out uh, on YouTube, I believe. Uh, well, Rush, uh, moving on, Rush, the Missing Tour Books collection is now available at the Rush Backstage Club, which offers awesome Rush merchandise. Uh, Rush's first tour book was made available on the band's North American tour in support of 2112, and each subsequent tour after that point was all would also include a tour book. So there's none of the band's first three albums are represented by a tour book until now. Rush has decided to fill that gap and they've released the missing tour, back, tour books collection uh, at Rush Backstage Club. Uh, you can find Rush, the first tour book, Fly By Night and Caress of Steel, which is really interesting. They made tour books for those three tours or are these now like, like we're going to make new items as if there had been tour books for those tours. No, there were no tour books for the three first tours. Yeah, I didn't tours. think so, yeah. Yeah, so, they, so to fill in that gap, they've uh, produced tour books for those tours. Which so is, it's like, what if exactly. there had been... Oh, they never yeah. existed. They never existed until now. I think that's fantastic, actually, and Rush is probably the only band that could do it, and it wouldn't be stupid. If any other band did it, people would be like, why but for rush we are all completists and everything has to be every box checked so i'm glad that there are now tour books for every tour even if the you know first three had to be you know fabricated yeah um well you can find them there i guess they're individual for the set of three there's it's 79.99 which includes a bonus lithograph of the fly by night tour book cover you can also purchase them individually at 29.99 so that's folks, nothing yeah if you're a collector of tour books this is it this is your this is your one opportunity to fill in those missing tour books right um well here we are uh at episode 16 and what are we going to talk about as a focus uh well we've dan and i've talked about it we've decided to talk about two what I consider overlooked albums, uh, Presto and Roll the Bones. However, uh, before we dig deep, we should mention that this summer we lost uh, another major player uh, in the music uh, industry, uh, English musician, songwriter, and record producer Rupert Neville Hine, yes. uh, who worked on these two great albums with the band. Hine also produced albums for artists including Kevin Ayers, Tina Turner, Howard Jones, Saga, The Fix, Bob Geldof, Thompson Twins, Stevie Nicks, Chris DeBerge, Suzanne Vega, Underworld, Duncan Sheik, Formula, and Eleanor McEvoy. Uh, he also recorded 11 albums, including those billed under his own name, the Suedo, uh, pseudo band name Think Ben, uh, and as a member of the band Quantum Jump. Hmm. Uh, when uh, Hein passed, uh, this note appeared on the uh, official Rush site on Friday, June 5th, 2020. In the wee hours, this is on the website after he passed. In the wee hours of this morning, our dear friend and super talented musician, songwriter, and producer of two Rush albums, Presto and Roll the Bones, sadly passed away. Roop was always such an upbeat, unflappable, and all-around lovely chap to work with and to be around. His influence on our music 
and on our attitude towards enjoying life was profound and he shall be he shall be sorely missed by so many there are still many of his very british expressions that have made their way permanently into our lexicon and we can see his smiling face and the twinkle in his eye whilst saying jolly d r.i.p dear roop we love you man so you can you can just yeah, to the to the to the Hind family and uh, to the Rush family, uh, you know, what happens is in this show we ask people what some of their favorite albums are, and there are a couple that come up a lot. Yeah, uh, in the top five, uh, one is Clockwork Angels as a favorite, uh, but also Presto has been coming up a yes. lot as a as a favorite. I've I mean I, in my long years of listening to Rush, I've, I've I mean, there is very few rush things that I dislike when it comes to their music. Um, I've mentioned before, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of Tess for Echo. Um, I like a few songs on that album. Um, there, there are some things I like about it, some things I dislike. Um, Presto, I've always heard, kind of got, got panned and roll the bones as well. <clears throat> so I think it's a good show to kind of examine um, these two albums. And our, we have a special guest, which we'll announce in a minute, that is directly related to these two albums. Um, but uh, Presto in particular, uh, well, let me ask you, Dan. I mean, you're, you're a Rush fan. Uh, you yes. like certain things about Rush. You like a certain era of Rush compared to other eras of Rush. You know, in the, in the, the legacy of this band and their, um, this incredible uh, discography, w- how do these two albums, where do they place for you? Okay, when those albums came out, I did not like them. Uh, I was 19 when Presto came out and 21 when Roll the Bones came out. And at that time in my life, I was basically just like, Slayer, 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 Slayer. Not a huge Rush fan at the time. And uh, what I did like was like more like 70s prog stuff, you know, much more guitar oriented, much heavier that kind of thing. And so I, stuff from that period, I had tended to give kind of short shrift and did not really give them the attention they deserved. Uh, when Neil passed, I was like, let me go back and like kind of revisit what, you know, uh, Hold Your Fire, Presto, Roll the Bones. And they're much better than I remembered. Uh, my big objection to Roll the Bones was always the song Roll the Bones. Uh, but the last time I listened to it, I was like, oh, okay. You know, when that song came up, I skipped it. And it was very interesting because when I did that, the rest of the album did not work. You have to have that song there just, or, or something is missing. And I so never... It re- sets up the album, you mean? No, it's just, it, the, there's this kind... I don't want to say like a sameness, but that song, like kind of like, it's a, a little bit of a break in like what happens in the first two songs before it what happens next is a little, you know, the, all their albums have these like hills and valleys and that one, if you skip it, you know, the landscape is a little less interesting. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, that was, that was just very interesting to me because I, you know, I never really liked that song. I was uh, the rapping section, you know, made me weep when I heard it, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, but it, it has to be there. And uh, you know, that's I, Getty Lee, right? That's Getty Lee singing. They yes. just, they brought yeah. the frequency down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, I think it says a lot for, you know, how much thought they put into their albums and how much that each one was like really its own self-contained thing. And if you took one part out, it didn't work. Right. Even, even if you were not a fan of that part, like, right. uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, uh, I think I'm going bald as much as our previous guests have enjoyed yeah. that. Sh- yeah. But, you know, it's, it sets up for like that uh, the necromancer is coming next. It, you know, right. it's like a little light break before you get into that. Sure. And I just never really thought of that before for those later albums. But every, everything is planned. I mean, every, every album has some sort of theme with Rush. Therefore, yeah. thematically, you could consider every album a concept album in yes. that way. Yeah. So I see what you mean. It's a disruption. If you take one piece of that equation out, it disrupts the the rest of the flow of the, of the record. And this is it, a time, makes- for folks who are listening, uh, who are younger, there was a time where it was meaningful to have a certain song play uh, in what order. So a band yes. actually cared about, well, does this song, should this song, does this song set up the next song and what do these songs mm-hmm. paired together so, so it meant that part one or side one and side two 
had gave you a different experience. Right. There had to be like a flow that was maintained over the course of 40 minutes, an hour, that kind of thing. And, you know, now it's singles. And, uh, you know, the art of making albums has been lost to a certain degree. Uh, but, you know, I mean, if you listen, you know, if you listen to artists who really were from the album zero, like, you know, Led Zeppelin, those are architectural works that a lot of what has been put into a lot of design have been put into their perfect because of the pacing and because of the way that they were all mapped out. Same with these guys, you know, and uh, it, that was, it was just interesting to me to, you know, to take out a song that I really had problems with and realized why it absolutely needed to be there, even if I didn't care for it. So yeah. we've only uh, been nine songs, or, you know, it's... Of the two albums, which one is your favorite? I like Presto a little better, yeah. um, but I mean, there are good things on both albums. Uh, yeah. I was very happy to revisit them both. Yeah, uh, I got a lot more out of them than I did when I was much younger and doing bong hits since dawn, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, it's, the work holds up. Yeah. All of their work holds up, no matter how old it is, no matter when they did it. And it tends not to be too uh, trendy for what was going on at the time. I, th I think maybe my objection to the rapping part in Roll the Bones is like that. I probably just thought they were being trendy. Right. Uh, but, you know, now having had some time to think about it, that's probably not, I can't see them making that kind of a decision, you know, being like, oh, the kids today like rap, we got to put something in there so we can be current. You know, I can't see them doing that. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, they get a lot of slack for that part, I think, and a lot of people don't like it. I, you know, I just don't even think about it. I think of it as yeah. like a kind of a funny little thing. Yeah, you, know? um, you, have, you have a sense of humor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, right, so I just yeah. overlook it. I, I guess I don't even, when, even when it's on, I, I'll sing to it, but I don't really, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's just, it's part of it, right? So, uh, yeah. but yeah, let's get into Presto. So uh, yeah, I think, you know, if I was to choose the two, it, it's going to be a hard one for me. I love right. both albums, but I think the one that hit me, and they're so close in time, uh, the recording of these two albums, I mean, they really worked on one right after the other with these right. two albums. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's kind of just one big experience for me, Presto, and then and then Roll the Bones. But um being 21 years old and and uh this having roll the bones as you know kind of uh surface at that time at this time in my life where i was in transition moving from my mom's house being in a my first heavy duty relationship that not really working out uh and relying on this album as my you know kind of my go-to you know to therapy it's a provided yeah. a lot of therapy for me i think sure. it came at, it came at the right time but uh, presto so gregory haney of all music described the album as a workmanlike uh, as workmanlike and removed from the creativity of their earlier works however he asserts that the songs aren't terrible just a sense that something is not quite clicking perhaps due to the length of time it had been since the band wrote more traditional guitar based songs. However, before each, uh, before such a review was posted on November 10th, 2012, the site had listed a favorable 4.5 uh, star out of possible five reviews of the album by Mackenzie Wilson of which little trace remains. Wilson described the album as one that intelligently leads Rush into the 90s without musical bleakness. I, I think that's probably fairly accurate. Yeah, I would say um, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And again, Presto, I think is be, there's a, like a new kind of uh, a new discovery of Presto now uh, with newer fans. Yeah. Uh, and um, it has that vibe, that 90s thing to it, you know. And even if you look at them uh, at the live performances, of course, we had Billy Sheehan on that uh, on the show last week, and he was on that tour with uh, with Rush, and you know we were making jokes about the the air the air bunnies and the hats yeah. shaking back and forth, and you know lots of funny little things. But if you look at how Rush are, how they present themselves on stage, you know they're just super refined. Uh, they're on top of their game. Uh, the songwriting's there. I mean, they're just a machine by that by that point. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, there it is. But um, we, you know, uh, when producing the show, I asked Dan, uh, you know, what some of his favorite songs were on the album, and you chose "The Pass," uh, and "The Pass" comes up. No, I chose uh, I chose "Available Light." Oh, okay. You know, Billy Sheehan, Billy Sheehan chose uh, "Available Light." I chose "The Pass" and oh. "Chain Lightning." Um, the Pass, the Pass is great, and yeah. I know a lot of a lot of people for them. That's the Rush song. 
that's their favorite Rush song of all time. That's why I I, I, I brought it up because Sheehan uh, uh, loved uh, that song. Um, I want to I just want to pull up uh, little bits and pieces of these uh, songs uh, as well as your song. Um, let's let's uh, let's pull up uh, Available Light. stop it there i had to stop it after that transition that's such a beautiful uh interlude there yeah. that change you know it's so heavy you know i love it that uh, yeah. bit that bit going into when you know when he says available light by yeah. himself that, right. that little bit i excellent i it know it's yeah. it's so good uh so uh chain lightning was my one of my picks let's pull that one up song so much it's such a great well i need to bring up the pass because the pass comes up a lot i like yep. the pass um it's it's a good one uh and it just comes up so much so let's pull up the pass yeah So the pass, uh, as it says, the pass concerns a friend of Peart's who joined him on a cycle ride and once discussed juvenile suicide, which inspired the lyrics for the song 
Peart named it the song he had worked the hardest on due to the delicate nature of the subject. The song became a group favorite. Peart picked the track as the reason to choose Presto as one album of theirs that they would re-record if they could. Huh. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, what did you say? Hey, what? No, I don't have it. I don't have it. Not I, happy with the sound of the you album. You know, I think you know. I I'm I'm saying I I've always heard this about Presto that they weren't happy with the quality of the production of the album. And this is what we're listening to now is the remastered version right. uh, of of it. So if, I think if you listen to those original recordings, it is a little muddled. Um, you know, going back. You know, again. When I was listening to this, it was on, it was, you know, tape or, of course, right. CD. I, I didn't have the best hi-fi equipment back then. So um, we'll have to, and folks, if you keep listening in, we're going to find out why because of our special guests. So, yes, uh, this is yeah, true. Definitely. Um, some, uh, some interesting facts about Presto. Uh, Presto is the 13th studio album by Rush. It was released November 21st, 1989 by Anthem Records and was the band's first album released internationally by Atlantic Records, followed by the group's departure from Mercury. Presto marked another change in the band's sound with guitar taking more do dominant role in the writing with the reduction of synthesizers and a return towards a more guitar-driven towards more guitar driven arrangements. Presto reached number seven in Canada and number 16 in the United States. Rush supported the album with the Presto tour from February to June, 1990. Presto reached gold certification by the Recording Industry Association of America for selling 500,000 copies. In a contrast, in the contrast to previous albums, uh, Grace Under Pressure, Power Windows, and Hold Your Fire. The album does not contain an overall running lyrical theme or what Peart described as heavy uh, lyrical messages, instead adopting a more loose approach with each track making its own statement. The band's title uh, was an idea that Rush had considered uh, to use for a show of hands, but when Peart had started writing for a song entitled Presto, it was then used as the title. Very interesting. I, again, going back to Presto, I'm, I'm so delighted that um this album is getting a new uh a new look over because i think it's an important one for rush and it's just got a really it's just got you know i don't know i don't want to say dark vibe to it i mean you look at the cover and it's you know the bunnies and the it's, it's black, rabbits it's got rabbits and it's, it's black and white. season yeah hmm. um you know you ever see when when i was a kid there was a movie that freaked me out called watership down <sighs> traumatized and me the animation yeah, totally. one I, th I couldn't get to sleep you know oh, yeah totally yeah my um, mother's like oh let's go see this movie it's about, <laughs> got bunnies yeah yeah i was i was like eight and i was like i gotta get me out of here <laughs> i i couldn't i literally couldn't i still like think about it in my head i'm like oh um so the album to me the album cover i i don't i just don't you know i'm a design i'm a graphic designer by trade and um you know visual artist so there's a darkness to presto um the, 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 there's storm clouds um i should probably do a little bit more research into uh, uh why sime uh, uh designed this or what his thought was behind it which uh um, is a failure on my behalf I should, now that i'm talking about uh presto uh, and the album art but um anyway yeah there's a there's to me there's a darkness and a serious a real seriousness to this album um so anyway by contrast to roll the bones which we're going to get into which is you know, we've often said as uh, having a production call quality is bright. There's a brightness to, um, there's an optimism to Roll the Bones, I think, uh, right. uh, uh, by comparison to Presto, which might be the antithesis of that. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm, my, maybe I'm wrong. I'm going with my vibes. But uh, with Roll the Bones, Odyssey wrote that the album isn't a classic, but that it was Rush's best album since Power Windows in 85. They also wrote that it had a nice and simple hard rock sound. Ultimate classic rock included Roll the Bones in their uh, top 190s rock albums, which I hear that a lot. They also ranked it the ninth out of 19 of best Rush albums, writing, even though synths still, cl still clang about and a few of the experience go too far. Um, yes, that's Getty's, Getty Lee rapping on the title track. The songwriting is stupendous, and I would have to agree. Right. So again... Uh, Dan, I asked you what your favorite song was uh, on um, on Roll the Bones. Dreamline. Dreamline. Yeah. 
Of course it's, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's a great opener. It uh, really is. Both live and on the, you know, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better opener than that, I don't think. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is, this is from a band that has had Tom Sawyer as an opener, Spirit of Radio as an opener. And, you know, they're just in the, they're just in the habit of really good openers. Uh, but that one, I think, is excellent. Uh, even the, you know, the like kind of like brass sound to it that, you know, that it kind of has, uh, I think is great. Yeah. Um, the opening verse of Dreamline has references to astronomy, which Peart was inspired by after cycling several hundred miles from C Cincinnati to Columbus. Wow. Ohio, um, between two gigs on the Presto tour. Upon arrival, he watched the popular science series Nova on the public broadcasting, PBS public broadcasting service in a program on satellite imaging, which captured his imagination. And boy, did he really do a good job. I mean, this, mm -hmm. you know, I, I love the version of this song on um, different stages. Yeah. Uh, it's just a fresh, you know, I like the later versions, but uh the, that version on different I love the different stages um, when um, when I was off. saying it's a great opener I yeah. like specifically was thinking of uh, the different stages version That's I love great. it it's great. I, you know what I'm gonna like pull that up later I gonna I even I used to listen to different stages all the time I love the the collection of songs on there mm -hmm. um, it, it 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 to me I love and I also love show of hands um, those two albums I really 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 dig um, but uh, I haven't listened to I, that was on concert ro rotation in my twenties. Yeah, uh, um, uh, different stages. I just love it. Uh, so let's listen to a little bit of Dreamline, and I know it's a fan favorite. Uh, and Rush, this was an opening tune on many Rush tours for years. So let's listen to it. He's got a roadmap of Jupiter. Radar fix on the stars all along the highway. She's got a liquid crystal compass, a picture book of the rivers under the Sahara. They travel in the time of the prophets on the desert highway, straight to the heart of the sun. Like lovers and heroes, I'm the restless part. stop it there what a fabulous tune that is oh boy i got goosebumps um and how physically painful to have to turn it off after like 30 <laughs> seconds or it's like ah it's just getting it's getting to the good part i know i know i'm but, sorry you know, i'm sorry well we can do. no maybe we can inspire folks to put it on uh on their uh on their iphones or wherever they stream from or maybe even yes. a record I, I think the vinyl for this is like 300 dollars. you can't find it anywhere really? um oh yeah very expensive i huh. i they even i I'm not sure if they re-released it or what, but the original vinyl for the 90s, uh, I was bidding on a Counterparts album and I stopped at 150 bucks. I'm like, I just can't afford it. <laughs> That's insane. I know, I know. That's insane. I, I know, I know. I wish I bought them when I, uh, and forget about any of the live albums. I mean, if anything was sold, like a show of hands, I was bidding on that. That went up That went up a couple hundred. You know, I, I just couldn't uh, swing it. That's uh, the double though, right? That's a double, yeah, yeah. I love I love that album so much. I know it's it's, it's pricey, man. Yeah. Um, all right, and my my pick was uh, an album, uh, a song that uh, really mattered to me uh, in, in my twenties. Uh, that I it was just my go to song, and when I listen to it, I almost want to tear up because I was just having such a difficult time then, and uh, it brings me back to my former self. Uh, but what a beautiful song! It's called "The Big Wheel." Uh, let's check it out. Oh yeah.
song um really uh, just so big and punctuated and yeah heavy i mean it's just heavy stuff i get headphones on i'm listening to this with headphones i'm like holy cow i don't listen to music enough with headphones on i mean i i try to you know give it the high fidelity thing in my house but you know when you put put the headphones on man you really hear it's, all the it's nuances. A very different experience with headphones so much i know it's incredible well i i can't i can't we can't ignore uh there's just one other tune on here that i think deserves uh some acknowledgement uh and it's it's a non-lyrical tune it's called where's my thing uh yes. where's my thing was the band's first int- instrumental since yyz for moving pictures very interesting uh it has a humorous subtitle of part uh oh, remind me part four gangster of boats iv is that four Yes. Oh, okay, again, trilogy, referring to an ins- inside joke where Lee and Lyson threatened to name a Rush album Gangster of Boats if Peart has difficulty in coming up with one. Plus the fact that it's the fourth part of a trilogy. Peart wrote that the group had wanted to record an instrumental for a while at this point uh, and that the group had a lot of fun recording it. They wanted, they had wanted to do one for Presto, but every time Lee and Lyson had a piece of, of music, uh, a lyric that Peart had written fit well uh, together with it. Uh, this time around, Peart let the two write an instru- instrumental track and deliberately avoided to feed them lyrics until they had put one together. Rather uh, than making the track a showcase for the group's playing ability, Lee and Lyson wanted to give it a verse, chorus section, and make it sound like a genuine song. Let's listen to Where's My Thing. Um, I love this is why I love Rush because they just jammed I mean they just said let's just you know okay we're a lyrical band Um, you know uh, this is what we do and we do it really well but we're also a musicians band I mean we also play really well even without lyrics which some bands can't really pull off you know Um, what saddens me and uh, what I would have loved to have seen them do at some point in their career was live improv I would have loved to see them just go on stage and just be like, you know, like, uh, like King Crimson used to do. Yeah. It's just like, okay, next 10 minutes, who knows? Uh, you know, they could certainly do it. And, uh, you know, they were certainly all uh, good enough musicians to do it. Um, but, you know, I mean, I just like having the opportunity also to, you know, to just really hear the instruments. Uh, you know what I mean? You When you listen to that song, you can tell exactly where the verse would have been, exactly where the chorus would have been, but it's, sometimes it's nice not to have those things there. So I can hear Neil a little better on the ride symbol, you know, that kind of thing, you know, so what, yeah. they're cool. <laughs> Whatever they did, it's, it's cool. Yeah. Um, well, Roll the Bones uh, is the band's 14th studio album. 
Uh, it was released September 3rd, 1991 on Anthem Records. The band began working on Roll the Bones after a brief creative hiatus following the, the tour promoting their previous release, Presto. Roll the Bones was a return to commercial success for the band, reaching number three in the United States, number 10 in the UK, and number 11 in Canada between September 91 and September 92. Six songs from the album were released as singles. The album won a Juno Award for Best Album Design at the 1992 Awards. In August 2001, the album was certified platinum by the recording industry association of america for selling one million copies in the u.s in june 1990 rush finished touring their previous album presto uh in uh, 1989 uh they purposely kept the tour short which lee said was due to the group feeling over cautious about touring the album however it became an enjoyable and positive positive experience for them and by the time it finished quote we were so charged up we wanted to keep on playing end quote this renewed energy in the band carried through to the writing and recording sessions for Roll the Bones, which is purely evident. And I talked about, right. I talked about that vibe with uh, uh, coming out of Presto, feeling a little bit dark for me. Uh, and here is uh, uh, Lee uh, saying, um, uh, uh, we're so charged up, we wanted to keep, keep on playing and then renewed energy. And, and you feel that vibe. Uh, and Roll the Bones, most certainly. Uh, as with Presto, Rush started to work by retreating to Chalet Studios, a remote studio in Claremont, Ontario. They stayed for two and a half months with Lee and Lyson working on the music while Peart wrote lyrics. The three would reconvene in the evening where Peart could hear or would hear what the other two had come up with during the day. Lee had developed an interest in bird watching and insured some broken bird and insured some bro broken bird feeders by the studio window were repair repaired and filled with feed, which he enjoyed to observe while writing. Hmm. The album's liner notes include a thanks to birds. Uh, the album contains a running lyrical theme concerning the element of chance in different aspects of life, which Peart had devised while experimenting with lyrics. The first lyric that he wrote for the album was used on Face Up, specifically, quote, turn it up or turn that wild card down. Uh, Roll the Bones was recorded at Le Studio in Morin Heights, Quebec, uh, in McClear Place in Toronto. Uh, between February and May 91, the band resumed working on working with co-producer Rupert Hine and engineer Steven Taylor, both of whom had worked on Presto. The band had originally planned to release the album in January 92, but they finished it in two months early. Uh, they thanked the news channel CNN in their liner notes as they had the channel on while writing, and Lee recalled it was sometimes difficult to stop watching it while numerous ev numerous events were taking place. Good luck writing that album now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Seriously. Peart, uh, Peart uh, wrote, uh, we'd be waiting 10 years for an album for yeah. much. Uh, Peart wrote, what the, uh, wrote that the group found each stage of the recording process particularly enjoyable and satisfying, which sparked a new conviction and sense of rebirth within the group. Lee described the writing sessions for the album as very positive and very optimistic which again is i think there it is the optimism mm -hmm. i didn't even you know i i made my notes here but i really just forgot about that that it is an optimistic album there's a sense right. of optimism with uh with roll the bones and going back to talking about rupert hine the influence of rupert hine uh who's no longer with us uh sadly uh we uh he, rupert also brought on engineer uh famed uh english uh, uh engineer stephen taylor who is going to be our guest on our show today. Isn't that yep. incredible? Excellent segue. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I worked on it all night. But yes, uh, we want to introduce uh, Stephen Taylor to the show. Stephen W. Taylor is an English mixing and recording engineer, music producer, musician, composer, and sound designer who's contributed towards many albums for many artists, including Kate Bush, Suzanne Vega, Peter, Peter Gabriel, Underworld, Duncan Sheik, Howard Jones, Stevie Nicks, Mila Jovovich, Rush, Bob Geldof, Rupert, uh, Rupert Hine, and Tina Turner. Uh, Taylor works closely with producer and filmmaker and artist Sadia Sadia, uh, starting with analog and tape techniques and subsequently, subsequently an early adopter of synthesis, sampling, and digital technology. He's based out of one of the four long-term project spaces at Real World Studios in Wiltshire, England. Stephen... Taylor, welcome to Two Guys Talking Rush. You're looking well. 
I'm feeling good, actually. How are you guys? You look like a rock star, man. Oh, no, not, not at all. <laughs> I, wish I, could, I wish I could grow my hair long. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> you pull it off well, man. How are oh, you? Thank you. I'm very good, thank you. Yes, just uh, sitting here, standing by, thinking about Rush. Uh, it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, in our conversations, you mentioned that and that you might have to go and revisit the albums. You know, I, I think people in the Rush world uh, don't realize that, you know, a producers, this is their work. They move yes. on to other projects. But our yeah. Rush fans are, might be slightly ignorant thinking that, you just got so hooked on Rush during those two albums <laughs> that you never stopped listening to your to the work you've done with them. When I, so when I think of the thousands of tracks I must have mixed, recorded, right. and mixed since then, but uh, but I did go back and listen to the albums. So uh, good, you know, I, some memories coming back. Good, good, good. We'll <laughs> we'll we'll dig into them. But thank you yeah. for joining. This is Dan Buxman, my co-host. Dan Buxman. Nice Hi, to Dan. meet you. Please. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Dan's an author. I'm an author, and uh, uh, this is our show, uh, Two Guys Talking mm -hmm. Rush. And, uh, you know, our show, um, you know, we do get into, you know, the kind of micro, kind of uh, really super analytical uh, stuff about songs. But we, we mostly kind of, we look at the broader side of Rush, how Rush has impacted uh, culture, uh, you know, science, politics, uh, you know, areas of Rush that really have gone undiscovered by other commentary on the band. Um, why just have another podcast about the same old thing? But, um, you know, where, um, you know, when we look at albums, in some shows we have uh, looked at albums, we, we think of albums in a special way. A lot of albums get super, super highlighted uh, like mm. 2112 and uh, of course moving pictures magnificent albums yeah. but um, and we'll get into the the roll the bones of the presto uh, uh, analysis later but uh, these were two albums that Dan and I felt that just got overlooked and were for me a very special part of my growing up in the in the 90s and my 20 something we talked about this before Stephen. Yes. how you know there's a special there's something special about these two albums uh, and i think it it comes up a lot in our in our podcast that especially presto it, it comes up in the top five we always ask guests um yeah. what their favorite albums are and presto has just come up fairly consistently it um, comes up a lot from young people too which i was very surprised by we did a um a round table uh, a few weeks ago with um, th these guys who were like at least 20, I'm, I'm 51. These guys were at least 20 years younger than us, yes. probably more. Yeah. And uh, we were all going through talking about what our favorite albums were. And like a couple of them said Presto, which I was really surprised by, uh, not because it's bad or anything like that. I was just, I didn't, ex I didn't expect it necessarily to resonate with younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in part, it just, it doesn't sound like the way music sounds today it's not produced right? no. in the same way it's a, yeah you understand yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. of course you understand um, <laughs> no but I, i'm it's surprising me how many young people like i guess these guys were in their 20s or something like that it's it's just surprising me how much they connect with it and, it must be uh, something more to do with the actual songs rather sure. than the presentation in a sense uh because i think that um it was very interesting rupert hein getting involved with them at that stage where his focus really was very much more on the sort of songwriting side of things. So um, I wonder if that's what maybe connects with some people more than others, in a sense. I, I think you're right. I think it does mm. have a lot to the songwriting. Um, but, you know, we just, before uh, you came on the show, we, we, we did give you a proper uh, uh, um, introduction uh, with a little bit about mm. your background. Uh, and also we, we talked about, when you hear the, the podcast in its entirety uh we do analyze a few of the songs and listen to a few snippets of, of yes. tunes and with headphones on um those albums are just so uh beautiful sounding and um you know again i you know having you on the show is is significant i i want to know uh, you know from a, a, a production standpoint what you bring to the table before coming into uh with you know coming into a, a setting like this with a band that by the time they come in the studio in the 90s there they have decades of experience of uh, musicianship and songwriting and and all that but you you grew up studying and performing music professionally i have here in my notes at the age of eight uh you became yep. a boy chorister at the new college school in oxford eventually That's becoming right. a soloist and head mm -hmm. chorister um 
what was it like for you growing up in England and just getting started in the music world? What, what can you talk well, about? Well, it's, it's very strange, really, because uh, I never really knew anything else. You know, <laughs> the world was so different then. Uh, my parents obviously must have given me music lessons from about the age of six at home. And uh, they, uh, I remember having piano lessons and singing lessons. And on the basis of that, um, I was uh, sent for a, a, to try for a scholarship to, to this choir school. Funnily enough, my eldest brother, 10 years previous, he, he had been there. So he, he was kind of first. He did not go on into music, but um, so I, I, I just, I was introduced to a very formal musical training from the age of eight, uh, which um, was uh, it, it incredibly memorable. Um, it, it's funny being in, a, being in a chapel choir like that and doing the music. It wasn't at all a religious experience at all. It, it, for me, it was just this sort of fascinating, fun thing to do with the music. And um, so I, I was introduced to all this music and also encouraged to play instruments and all the rest. But because I had two brothers and two sisters who were older than me, and, this, and we're talking about the sort of early to mid 60s, they were just getting into all this you know, current pop music, the Beatles and the Beach Boys and the Who and bands like that. And so I was, I was getting this, um, when I was home during the holidays and I was hanging out with my brothers and sisters, I was absorbing the pop music. During the term time, I was um, living at the school and we were very, very shut down and controlled and, you know, we didn't have spare time. We woke up in the morning, straight to work, uh, choir practice just before lunch, then lunch, then uh, enforced rest, then sports, then homework, then tea, then evening service, then bed. You know, it was like that every day. Yeah. So it was a very intense discipline, but it gave me a real sense of, um, I don't know, uh, just the whole sense of professionalism. Structure. structure. And structure, yeah. And sort of work ethic uh, that has... has done me very well obviously once I left that environment and I went on to study music further at upper school and then music college it, it was broadening out and getting involved in much more different areas of music so and you, I, became, I was, you had developed a fascination for recording uh and yeah. became, after you realized in my notes here um, yeah. um I write that you you played in orchestras ensembles uh experimental That's groups right. and bands but you felt as though the performer side of things wasn't really for you. So you, you discovered the other side of music, which was the recording side, right? Well, that had always been a hobby. That yeah. had always been a hobby, uh, messing around with the family's original tape recorder, which was very, very basic. But uh, yeah. I used to do terrible things with it, you know, just wrapping sellotape around the uh, capstan and things like that, which you're not supposed to do. But uh, I discovered, you know, for, just through experimentation, I didn't, get any information about this from anywhere else but uh, so that was kind of my hobby anyway and as I when I was about 15 16 I started forming bands at school uh, we get a tape recorder in and start recording what we are doing so it's kind of like I was making the transition that early even though I carried it on performing for another four or five years till I was about 20 uh, and then uh, it seemed like uh, there's sort of family pressure in a sense. Uh, I was quite keen to actually join a band and go off and do that. But I think there was family pressure that didn't want me to do that. I didn't want to be a music teacher. I didn't want to be just an orchestral classical musician. So for me, the next best thing was um, going off and getting involved in music recording, which uh, was the beginning of it for me. Yeah, um, it says in my notes here, uh, taking a lot of notes, um, that you <laughs> ultimately decided to go and search for a job uh, to yes. kind of get you through college or post-college. Um, well, yeah, but, I, I had been looking at a formal training yeah. with the BBC and I applied right. for it. And I, right. and I was going to go ahead and do that. But because I finished like on a Friday in, in July, in, uh, sorry, at the end of July in 1974, we're talking about, um, I, there were several months uh, open up 
before I could go to the BBC. So literally on the Monday morning following leaving college, I thought, I'll go and have a look for some kind of part-time job to tide me over. Uh, and I didn't really think about it. I hadn't put any, any forethought into it at all. I jumped on the underground train in London, went up to Soho, because I knew that was where the centre of the music and the film industries were. And I wandered up Wardour Street, famous street, where um, you know, lots of clubs and things like that. And I walked down this little alleyway and I saw a sign that said Trident Studios. And I thought, I think I've seen that on a couple of the albums I've got. So I didn't really know much about it. I literally walked in, said I'm looking for a job. And um, uh, the receptionist sent me up to, immediately sent me up to see the studio manager. Uh, and I said, I'm, I'm looking for a part-time job. And he said, well, we don't do part-time jobs. Um, you know, uh, you can either come and work for us or not. He said, basically, I think you're too old, you're overqualified, and you're too posh. <laughs> so, but I've got a feeling about you. Can you start tomorrow? And that's what I did. I started the next day as T-boy, runner, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, um, the, you know... The, I literally fell into that. Well, Trident Studios uh, is very well known. I right. mean, huge albums very, uh, came absolutely. out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is no joke. Uh, I mean, I, 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 looked it up, I looked it up, obviously, once I, once I started. And, of course, Beatles had recorded there, uh, the White Album, Hey Jude, stuff like that. All the early Bowie, all the early Elton John, um, you know, um, uh, all, ki all kinds of Harry Nilsson, Lou Reed, you know, all kinds of great bands like uh, Genesis and Van de Graaff Generator. Uh, and, you know, I walked in and I, I found myself um, running around and making tea for bands like Queen and Super Tramp and Ace in my first week, Crow. you know. So that was, uh, that was pretty astonishing. Even you, if were, you, you were how old at that time? What age were me, you? I was just coming up to 21 good lord so wow. that so this is like a whole new world has Absolutely. just opened up to you and i just exactly I, I have this mental image of you as like a very young person with you know the saucers you know cups of tea like, here you go mr mercury <laughs> that's how i would have been I, w I would have been completely awestruck and well it was it's very weird to come from i you know i'd been like um in some ways, quite sort of privileged by getting music scholarships right. and things. And I'd worked my way to the top in, in the choir. Then when I went to public school, I, I uh, public schools are private schools in the UK, yes. right. as you know. Um, I, then I had music scholarship there and I worked my way through. I went to music college and I got my diploma and all the rest. And suddenly, I'm down at the bottom rung. I'm a total apprentice, you know, and... Uh, a lot of my friends and family were kind of ashamed that I, I would go and do something like that. But I kind of knew that this was exciting and potential. Listen, if you didn't even go on to be as legendary as you were in the recording studio, just you being a T-boy for all these amazing acts would have been just as <laughs> massive yeah. of, a, of a feat, right? Uh, that's Absolutely. incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, so uh, you're there uh, at Trident, uh, and uh, you eventually get promoted uh, to uh, yeah. become a tape op, an assistant engineer. Um, yeah. what, how did that happen? How did that migration? And then I, I, you know, you assist on sessions with T-Rex, Cockney Rebel, Mahavishnu Orchestra, Spiders from That's Mars, right. Brand X. So, I mean, amazing. What an amazing yes. band. Yeah. Well, the, the thing about studio structures back then, there really wasn't a freelance market back then particularly in the UK, all the studios had their own in-house staff, their in-house style. You know, as, it, as I say, it really was like an apprenticeship. You would learn from your seniors or your mentors. Uh, but it was a, a very prolific time for a lot of the, these producers who, who came up through Trident. And so there was a fast turnover just when I joined. You know, people like Ken Scott had just left, Roy Thomas Baker, John Anthony, um, they were all moving on. And um, so at that time, they had two T boys, four tape ops assistants, and four engineers. And they were leaving. You know, the guys at the top were going on and becoming independent producers. And, and 
it really was that fast. In six months, I, I became a tape pop. And 18 months after that, I got my first engineering job. Now, that actually, in any time, from two years from the bottom to becoming an actual engineer was pretty fast. Yeah. And I only learnt my trade from the people at Trident. It's not like I went to college and learnt recording technology or anything like that. So it, it, this is how um, the kind of um, style and techniques and things got handed down, like generation to generation. And I, I think that's something that's not happening quite so much these days because we don't have these same kind of structures right. but um but i i i found myself um assisting quite a lot one particular engineer uh, <clears throat> dennis mckay who had been working with like chick Corea and my vishnu orchestra and brand x and tommy bolin and so i got introduced to all these acts um uh, as his assistant and then one day he he wanted to become a producer and when I became an engineer, my first job was mixing um, uh, an album for Tommy Bolan. And then just after that, I did a, a mixed an album for Gong. And then the first album that I recorded and mixed from start to finish was with Brand X, with Phil Collins at that time. So it was a very fast sort of journey that I went through. Um, and you ultimately become chief, chief engineer. As because <clears throat> when I became an engineer, I was number four in the line, but the three above me moved on, you know, and yeah. I suddenly found myself at the top of the list after three years. And then you so, had, uh, and then you had your own tea boy. Uh, I had my own assistants, <laughs> and T-boys, you know, it was, it's incredible. It's funny, T boy. I think here means intern, <laughs> right, Dan? We yes. would equate it's a T boy. It's intern, or runner, <laughs> or uh, gopher. Yeah, you know, I, exactly. you know, I think if I were if I were to call someone a T boy, if I were yeah. to do it, uh, I don't think they would take it uh, in the spirit in which it is meant normally. I yeah. can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. You'd end up on the news. Yeah. So someone yeah. would have a problem with it. Let's just say yeah, that. Yeah. It literally was trays of tea, cooking, yeah. fetching and running, operating a reception at, uh, yeah. during the night, security at oh. night, uh, running to head office. You know, it was whatever they wanted you to do. Yeah, essential work. Trial by fire. Trial by fire. Yeah. If you yeah. if you could actually survive that, then you had the you had the guts to go on and and carry on. That's what they were looking for. So by chance, you go you go to Trident and yeah, you it evolves into that. Isn't that incredible? Actually, have, have you got Three minutes for me to tell you an even more. Please do it. Do it. Yes. <clears throat> Fifteen years later, uh, I I was living in the countryside and I was travelling on a motorway down to visit my mother about a hundred miles away. As I was joining the motorway, I saw a hitchhiker standing on the slip road. I've never ever before or since picked up a hitchhiker in my life. Uh, but this guy looked troubled so I invited him into the car and I said you know where are you going London I said I can drop you on my way that's fine uh, he said yeah look I'm really sorry he said I, I've been to visit my um, my mother and I got mugged so I don't have a wallet or any money or anything I'm just trying to get home I said you poor thing we got chatting uh, I asked him what he did for a living and he said oh I've worked um, uh, in television writing music for children's tv shows uh, various things that I'd heard of and all the rest. And he asked me, uh, what do you do? Um, and I, I said, well, uh, I'm in the music business, a uh, sound engineer. I, uh, and he said, oh, do you work at a studio? I said, yes, I worked at Trident Studios. He said, how weird. I worked at Trident Studios as a tea boy. Um, uh, and um, he said, I, I didn't do very well. I was late constantly and one morning I went in and uh, I got sacked I said well when was that I don't remember you from that time he said well I remember the date very clearly it was uh, August the 4th 1974 and I just my heart stopped I had to stop the car on the on the side of the road and I said do you realize I walked in to Trident a few minutes after you were sacked and I got the job. I mean, that is just the weirdest coincidence that's ever happened to me in my life. Ha 
15 years later after I joined Trident. So um, I don't know. You know, there was something very uh, special going on there. But uh, I mean, we both freaked out. We had a good laugh about it. We moved on. I haven't seen him since, but uh, there you go. It seems as though, I mean, you're, you're obviously a talented individual and you would have ended up doing something uh, impactful in the music industry, I assume. Uh, but the mere fact that you walk in and this happens, uh, this by chance encounter in a lot of ways. Um, yes. And then you work on an album called Roll the Bones, which Dan and I were talking <laughs> about is, is really based on this game of life, this by chance. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's pretty incredible. I don't know if you've ever made that connection before while you were in the studio thinking like, never, whoa. Never really of it but well, well done that, yeah that's pretty amazing <laughs> wow <laughs> that's, that's what we do here on two guys we make yeah, all connection right. to rush i can't yeah. help but notice this wonderful uh rotation of photos yeah. you have uh, <laughs> uh, in the background from i see rupert hein i see getty i see the studio um, it's it's uh, pictures taken during presto uh, that's at, so cool. uh, okay. mostly at morrow Heights. some in uh some taken in montreal some taken in uh, toronto at mcclair place love it it's it's, I just thought it'd be a little background. It's yeah, it's, <laughs> great. It's, 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 it's great. It's great. So, two guys, two guys are talking. Rush two, 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 two guys, two guys are talking. Rush two, two guys are talking. Rush two, two guys, two guys are talking. Rush, 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 two guys. Part two of the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast next week. That's not nice. Live music inspires millions around the world, but the concerts we all enjoy wouldn't be possible without the countless crew members working behind the scenes. As COVID-19 puts concerts on pause, we want to extend a helping hand to the touring and venue crews who depend on shows to make a living. Crew Nation was created to do just that. Crew members are the backbone of the live music industry, and we hope you'll join us in supporting them through this temporary intermission until we can once again unite millions around the world through the power of live music. Crew Nation is powered by Music Forward Foundation, a charitable 501c3 organization that will be administering the fund. Live Nation has committed $10 million to Crew Nation, contributing an initial $5 million to the fund, then matching the next $5 million given by artists, fans, and employees dollar for dollar. Please support Crew Nation at www.livenationentertainment.com slash crewnation.